So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this first panel in our anniversary event on making European policies work. My name is Edward Best and I've had the pleasure of working here since before the treaty, put it that way, and which has given me the privilege of having seen how European administrations have been affected by those major changes such as Alexander Stubb has just been highlighting to us. As Marco Onger also indicated in his introduction, one of our core missions is precisely how to make it work, policy implementation. Practical and legal, this is still very much at the heart of our mission, which I think we can sum up as trying to add value to the work of national and regional bodies in helping European administrations to manage European policies. Those policies change, and as Mr. Onger already said, this now in, covers in our work more skills, public management development. We work through learning and development, through training, organization of exchanges and other forms of practical support, but also in the spirit of what Alexander Stubb has just been saying, we want to help think. And so what we want to introduce in this panel are some of the questions about those changing challenges to which he referred and what it means for administrations to think about some of the needs and who knows some of the responses. Compared to 40 years ago when APA started, the context in which administrations operate has of course changed hugely. Public administration in itself remains in principle a sovereign preserve of the member states. While practical implementation of EU policies is now, according to the treaty, very clearly primarily the responsibility of the member states. Yet the reality is that administrations are increasingly built into a variety of, to use one of your phrases, Hedwig, multi-level cooperative governance structures. New forms of administrative cooperation among member states have grown up, while European actors, notably EU agencies, have emerged with powers to shape as well as to support national policies and practices. At the same time, the very quality of public administration, as well as the democratic quality of public governance, is now seen to be a legitimate and important subject of EU programmes and indeed an issue of common concern. So as we look to the future for our next generation APA, we would like to exchange thoughts about where we've got to in this uneven process of administrative integration. We hope there may be even some conclusions that might serve to orient our efforts in promoting learning and capacity building, which is the topic for the second panel, and perhaps in contributing the, to the political discussion, which we'll talk about after lunch. First of all, what has actually been happening? In some cases, there has been a shift towards stronger direct roles in enforcement, but I think the trend is more for stronger EU actions to help harmonize national implementation, deepen administrative cooperation, and support capacity building. One also sees the emergence of new approaches reflecting the principle of partnership for enforcement between the EU and member states, as well as an increase in private and decentralized mechanisms. We've tried to comment on some of these trends in the two background papers that we've is distributed for the occasion. A second question, which I hope we'll be able to exchange ideas about now, is whether or not these new multi-level arrangements are being adequately assessed in terms of matching institutional capacity to the needs of the policy area. Political preferences and fears often seem to, to prevail. Also, as these arrangements emerge, there are governance issues to be addressed. And some gaps, I think, with regard to accountability, as well as participation. Third, are these arrangements being adequately debated publicly 
so that they can be more widely understood and accepted as a, a legitimate sharing of responsibilities for achieving common overarching goals. Political leadership at all levels is required to help achieve what one might call a necessary internalization of the multi-level multi reality of public management. Now, in order to structure this discussion, we propose a rather simple framework derived from policy integration theory, how multi-level arrangements combine different kinds of horizontal and vertical coordination mechanisms. And we've asked three distinguished experts in these fields to introduce our discussion with remarks. We've invited our first panelist, Hedwig Hoffman, for a distinguished specialist in EU administrative law, and many other things, at the University of Luxembourg, to perhaps think in particular about the horizontal dimensions, the interaction between national actors, often with some support from the European level, to think about questions such as new trends in cross-border cooperation, or new patterns of networked enforcement which have grown up over the years. Are there any conclusions to be drawn from comparison between different experiences and sectors? What are new issues for the quality of governance? Then our second distinguished panelist, Ellen Voss from Maastricht University, we've invited within her presentation perhaps to think about more the vertical dimension and in particular the place of EU agencies in which she is a leading expert academically, but also contributing through studies for the Parliament and elsewhere in thinking about the future of this system. So are there cases of stronger centralisation of enforcement powers? What other new roles in our multi-level administrative systems are agencies playing? Are these choices being adequately assessed? Are there issues of accountability? And finally, Fed, from the Maastricht University, as well as the College of Europe, and of course, a former member of APA, I'm very glad to see you with us today. We've asked Fedden to share his thoughts about options and issues for the design of multi-level arrangements, looking at some cases about how we can try and get it better, and some thoughts about effective modalities of capacity building. Each panelist is going to speak for eight to ten minutes. I'm turning my stopwatch on. We will then have a short exchange but among them before opening the floor. So please do get your questions ready as they come up in your minds. And for online participants, please send them by the chat which is available and I will pick them up as best I can when they arrive. So without further ado, Hervik, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. To your comments. Thanks very much, Edward. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, for 40 years APA. Uh, also, uh, I you know, joined APA's um, touring circus of, of seminars around member states uh, over 20 years ago and, and had great fond memories of, of, of doing so. So it's, uh, it's really been a starting point in, in many of my academic thoughts um, to have this exchange uh, in member states with, um, with practitioners. What I'm, I was asked to do is to do a little bit of a horizontal, a little bit of groundwork. So 10 minutes, of course, is, is, uh, is, is a tight one for basics, trends, risks, and thoughts of, of what we're doing. But those, those four corner points I'll, I'll try, to, try to look at. The reason why we have to go back to basics is because it pains me to have to say that even. Um, all of what we're talking about of multi-level governance is based on the three pillars of Member states opening themselves vertically to direct effect and supremacy or primacy of EU law. Member states opening themselves horizontally to mutual recognition and the effect of decisions taken in one member state in another. And finally, as a third pillar, networks, administrative networks and governance networks, the thing we're really talking about. And the reason why we're talking about networks is because of our idea in Europe of a subsidiarity-based, decentralized implementation of policies. Now, the results and the, the reason why I, I mention these three basic pillars is because, as Alexander Stupp was, was discussing, some of those basic pillars 
are being questioned in member states right now, notably Poland and Hungary. And um, those are some of the issues we will we'll have to discuss of how to, how to move ahead with. Now, the results of these, these developments out of these three pillars, especially into a network structure, is a multiplication of actors. We have not just the dimension of many new agencies on the European level developed in various policies, but also, of course, on the member state level, new agencies, independent agencies, sometimes because of EU law requesting such, sometimes because the member states were developing themselves. But one of the very important factors is that we do not have any longer a hierarchic approach of anything which comes to a member state goes through the government and then goes down, but we have direct horizontal cooperation through policy networks be it in financial supervision or be it in food safety. Uh, you know, you, you look at whichever policy area you're looking at, that's, that's what's happening. And these dynamic networks then, of course, give different and very diverse types of act and, and forms of cooperation, uh, usually developing quite organically uh, according to the needs of each single policy. Now, let's go to the trends, therefore. So the first trend we were looking at already is the pluralization of the executive. But there's another trend, which Alexander Stupp was also according, mentioning, which is the change of information networks. So not only do we have more and more actors which cooperate, but if you look at the design of agencies of the last 20 years, nearly each and every one of the European agencies which were created also have as a mandate to create information networks. And so we are seeing, of course, with digitalization of the world, but these information networks are becoming the hub and the basis of cooperation and working together. And more and more we're seeing, of course, then a automation of the treatment of data in these networks. Think of Schengen, Eurodac, VIS, so the, uh, those, those kind of immigration matters. But also, if you look at financial supervision, um, of course, obviously, financial markets produce enormous amounts of data, which not a single civil servant could follow on a screen. You obviously have automation of these uh, data uh, uh, analysis. And that is the structure of what we're, what we're dealing with. And finally, um, as, a, as a third kind of big trend is the composite nature of decision-making. And that's an academic term which has been used. It says nothing else but the very fact that in our policy networks we are seeing a very close cooperation in procedures. Take, for example, the, the, the general data protection regulation and the enforcement thereof. You no longer have member states or European procedures. You have highly integrated procedures. If someone complains with a data protection supervisor in one member state, the network of data protection supervisors will identify a lead authority. And that lead authority runs the investigation with the help of other authorities and will receive guidance or even potentially binding decisions by a European agency, the European Data Protection Board. And altogether, you have a vast amount of different types of decision making and of forms of cooperation which surpass our understanding classically of the tools we have in, uh, in administrative structures. And this approach of composite decision making is spreading. I mean, you look at the case law of the Court of Justice, again from financial supervision or from food safety or from others, and you see this is the trend of what's um, causing problems and what is uh, a new and across sectors. Now, what are the risks here? This is just an assessment. What are the risks? Well, that, you know, looking at risk from the EU level, um, and that's what Edward was already mentioning, these complex networks make individuals and their rights not just less visible, but also much less uh, enforceable. So often we create these networks in an organic fashion, developing to the needs of a policy area, but have the individuals and the affected parties as an afterthought. And by that, we risk an alienation and a disenfranchising of individuals in the context, because if they cannot see who is taking a decision, how the decision is being made, and where to be able to seek potential redress, this is a, a serious problem. Um, 
And of course, our networking, which is wonderful to be on a decentral basis and have everyone happily work together, you know, in the sense of a big love fest, um, that from the outside looks pretty closed and pretty unpenetrable. Um, and so this is something which we have to look at. And of course, the risk from the member state level is also clear. We have dangers to the rule of law and to the respect of the rule of law. And rule of law is not just independence of courts and other elements, but also respect for the law of the land to which European law belongs. So primacy and direct effect, one of the first pillars of um, the uh, uh, current structure, is under attack in systems under the rule of law. Um, and that also, of course, you know, if you look at what Poland is doing in the moment, they're challenging also this idea that you cannot go only through top elements, but that there is a direct network of cooperation. It's not visible yet, but the whole idea, for example, that courts should not send preliminary reference to the Court of Justice without top courts allowing that is exactly the mentality of having a hierarchic approach to a member state where only through the top there is a coordination with others. And that is, therefore, a real challenge to the second pillar of what we're build, building our structure on. And um, then, of course, with a lack of this type of cooperation on a human level between actors, between judges, between administrators, between um, civil society parties, will come long term also a uh, lack of understanding of how this European project works together. So approaches, what can we do? Where do we, where do we go to? Um, let me mention three elements, and some of them might not be popular in the mainstream uh, discussion. The first is this fiendishly complex issue of simplification, which has been around for ages, and generations of politicians and experts have uh, lost their teeth over this issue by biting into the matter. But um, actually, when you take a step back, the solution is in front of our eyes. Um, a lot of policy developments, policy area developments, are developing as specific little policy unions. Remember the beginning of the European integration process. There was the European Coal and Steel Community and Eurotom, and, and then the European Economic Community. But there was a debate as to whether the European integration should be run by policy-specific communities or by a general horizontal approach. Finally, the horizontal approach won, but, but if you look at the developments in single policy areas, you see this development of specific communities and of specific forms of act in state aids and in, uh, again, financial supervision. In, uh, you know, in each policy area, you are seeing the diversification of types of act and therefore the creation de facto of little you know, policy unions with their epistemic communities uh, running the show. So, what did we do in the European Union when we were seeing this, these things are getting too complex? Remember APA and comitology, right? That was one of the first big topics. Well, what was the comitology decisions and now the comitology regulation? It was creating horizontally harmonized rules so that the great complexity can be simplified. What happened after the Santa Commission had to resign in 1999? The European financial regulations were created as a horizontal approach to harmonize the financial use. What is the proposal right now by the Commission on the AI Act? Right? It's a, a proposal to not just for private parties, but also for public actors to have a horizontal approach. And so we should definitely think of the huge potential of simplification of diverse forms of act by having a European Administrative Procedures Act, which would be able to take those various uh, forms, bring them together, reduce the complexity in legislation specifically and allow for um, a more accessible, simplified approach and case law from one area can then be applied in others more easily. Second approach. In our complex composite procedure structures where we have integration and interaction, one of the major problems is the allocation of responsibility. That is a problem because therefore it's difficult to hold parties to account. Remember, we have been building these executive networks but the accountability structures are still separate. Courts are organized on a national and a European level with very few coordination structures. There's only the preliminary reference procedure 
But that's all. And it only goes from member states to the European Court of Justice. There's no such thing as court networks which are any way as elaborate as the administrative networks we are seeing. And the same holds true for all other control mechanisms, for the ombudspeople, for the parliaments, and so on. Yes. Third, we need to increase the resilience of the system. And that is protect the system against the attacks from the inside. And in the moment, we're talking a lot about pecuniary um, types of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of control and of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, enforcement. We have to think about many more non-pecuniary ways where um, system compatibility of member states can be ensured. Uh, and, and that is, I think, very much what we're, what we're looking at. So, ladies and gentlemen, just to quickly um, uh, uh, summarize, you see the circle is closing. The very origin, the very pillars of our system are being challenged by our developments as well as by member states' developments. And I think if we take the step back and try to have a clear head and look at what horizontally we can do, we can find a lot of solutions um, which would help individuals' acceptability and, and the reform. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for what I found a very useful overview of how we got here and where we can try and go. And I'm looking forward to following up several of the points in our discussion once we've had the panel. So many thanks indeed, Herb. I think that was an excellent start to our panel. Without further ado, I'd yeah. like to invite Ellen to take over okay. and think and add thoughts. Yeah, Please. thank you so much, uh, Edward. And uh, uh, congratulations, congratulations to AIPA and I... Uh, also have fond memories of working together with, I, with Edward, in fact, and uh, also going to London often to train and, uh, pe staff members of uh, the European Medicines Agency. So congratulations, congratulations for all the achievements that you have made and all the contributions to making, in fact, European policy work. So I will discuss the vertical dimension of EU multi-level governance arrangements and, and in particular EU agencies, as Edward uh, has asked me to do. So public administration has this role in enforcement of the law vis-a-vis -vis those who are subject to it. This enforcement can be distinguished between in, in direct enforcement and indirect enforcement, whereby an, um, uh, direct enforcement is enforcement action by the EU or the national authorities that are aimed at directly at citizens and economic actors. And indirect enforcement is the control uh, that is um, directed to the application of EU law by public authorities, in particular the member states, and not whether citizens as such are, uh, the, uh, obey the, the law. So today I will discuss enforcement and the direct enforcement and specifically the role of European agencies in that. I will structure my talk as, uh, as follows. First, I will discuss why it is actually attractive to use these agencies in direct enforcement. Second, I will discuss uh, which agencies have such powers. Third, I will discuss the, 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 the collaboration between uh, agencies and national authorities. Fourth, I will discuss some general trends that can be observed, and fifth, I will connect this all to the concept of agencies as in-betweener, and finally, I will then address the queries of accountability that, in fact, are uh, connected to that. And as also um, Edward already hinted at, um, and, uh, and, and Herwig, it is ultimately also how to connect responsibilities to the various actors that uh, operate in this composite procedures and uh, decision-making. So why is it now attractive to use agencies for direct enforcement? The trend that has been observed by academic research, in particular by Mira Scholte and, and others, is that direct enforcement in general terms gains importance. And that is in fact, especially these agencies would be very helpful to, uh, to help um, enforce EU law because they could be uh, induce better compliance of EU law at the member state level. And, and these agencies are, um, that so runs the idea at least, the, they, ha they are apolitical, have the necessary expertise, and they will then produce high quality evaluations and better results. So di that's why we see that agencies in fact become more involved in the direct enforcement um, of EU law. 
So which agencies now have these kind of powers? So uh, agencies normally, uh, in general, there's various agencies that exist and they have advisory powers, especially in the policy making and the decision making phase. But we see a trend that these agencies are also being operated and operationalized in the enforcement. So we note that, for example, the European Aviation Safety Authority, as well as the European Fisheries Control Agencies, have obtained some inspection powers. So the new founding regulation of EASA of 2018, so that is the new uh, uh, amended version of uh, the founding regulation, determines that, for example, EASA and national authorities will be responsible for the oversight of, amongst others, holders of certificates and to conduct the necessary investigations, inspections, including ramp inspections, audits and other monetary activities to identify possible infringement by legal or natural persons. And they may take all kinds of enforcement measures, including also the amendment and the limits or suspending even or revoking of the certificates that were issued by the agency. They may uh, also um, uh, impose penalties um, uh, and, and uh, also had to terminate identified infringement. EASA can carry out these investigations independently or through competent national authorities or qualified entities. EASA cannot fine uh, companies, but it can instead request the European Commission to impose a fine to a natural or, or legal person. Another agency that has obtained much more limited inspection powers is EFCA, the European Fisheries Control Agencies. This agency can uh, carry out inspection in international waters, whereby actually the officials of the agency act as union inspectors. Internally, the mandate is a bit more limited of this agency, and the commission, uh, the agency will uh, help, in fact, the Commission to coordinate con and, and control inspection by the Member State. Frontex, the European Coast and Border Agency, has very recently more obtained uh, also powers and is now actively engaging in surveying, sur uh, surveying borders and returning irregular migrants. Another agency, and actually that's the agency with the most uh, and far-reaching enforcement uh, uh, powers is the European Securities and Market Sec uh, Authority, the ESMA. This agency has direct enforcement powers over private parties such as the credit rating agencies and trading repositories. The agency can also ask the national uh, enforcement authorities to inspect these credit agencies, for example, on its behalf. Now let me go into the collaboration with national authorities. So when you look in fact into the realities and well not the, even the realities but maybe even in the legal foundations of these agencies and the tasks that are assigned to these agencies, you see in fact this mix and mingle between these agencies and national authorities and um, to some extent it's difficult to, uh, uh, to, to clear, clarify who is responsible for what. And that's in fact, so this whole collaboration part with the national authorities is very much pushed in the, in the founding regulations. And this can lead uh, to some extent also had to shared enforcement to this composite procedure that, that Harry was talking about. This is, um, for example, the case with IASA. However, this is not the case of ESMA, which has almost exclusive uh, enforcement power. So this uh, agency, as I just told, can even ask the national authorities to operate on behalf of, uh, of, uh, of ESMA. So where the agencies maybe not have strong enforcement powers, they may carry out the, the task of coordination of uh, inspections. For example, an, Asian, an agency that does not have an inspection powers of its own, the European Medicines Agency, coordinate inspection by the national authorities in relation to the medicines that are authorized by means of the centralized procedure uh, that exists in the European Union. EMMA, so this uh, medicines agency, also organizes meetings with national inspectors. This is also the case for the European uh, fisheries control agencies for the inspections with the internal waters of the, uh, of the EU. 
EFCA coordinates the national inspections, whereby the national authorities car carry out the inspections based on the guidelines that are established by this agency, by the EFCA. So coming back to now to the general trends. In the literature, it has been observed that in situations in which agencies collaborate closely with national authority, there's often an also inter interdependence that supports and influences collaborations. This interdependence may often be observed in policy areas that have a strong cross-border international uh, character. Aviations and fisheries are, by definition, areas that, where, in fact, they, it's not a uh, policy is not made in isolation and which push for cooperation with national authorities. So in these areas, member states are in fact increasingly willing to delegate enforcement powers to the EU level and leave powers of coordination to the EU agencies. In this respect, um, and here in fact I answer uh, the uh, uh, question posed by Edward, we do not have enough research in fact uh, to, uh, on this, uh, this matter and I, I, I would suggest that we need to do more research on the precise relations between the agencies and the national authorities and on how and when they precisely cooperate which would have in fact consequences for accountability issues. Now, before I will address the issue of accountability, I would like to elaborate on the picture that arises of agencies as bodies that operate in between institutions and member states. The uh, concept of EU agencies as in-betweeners. In-betweeners is a term that is used in the UK for children of divorced parents. Now, this idea of children of divorced parents going back and forth, the parents, uh, and the parents have different pr responsibilities, but maybe not, uh, not, everyone, ev uh, not all the parents take their responsibilities. Michelle and I thought was very, uh, was very good, in fact, to depict the agencies being between, especially the EU institutions, especially the European Commission and the member states. So it's a concept that we are currently still exploring. And, um, but it sees, in fact, as it is in this in-betweeners concept, allows us to see the mushrooming of agencies at the EU level and would connect the phenomenon of agencies with the depiction of the EU as this composite and shared uh, administration, as Herwig was already t telling us about. Agencies are, as Deirdre Curtin, once observed also betwixt and between. And in Michelle Everson's words, a agencies are hierarchy beaters. We observe that agencies are by their, by their very definition interesting hybrids. This hybridity of agencies is already expressed, both institutional in their relationship within, uh, within their independence from institutions and the member states, because member states, uh, the representatives are in the, already in their management board of agencies and they have also some in other organs where member states and uh, representatives operate, as well subs as substantively in their multiple tasks. Representatives of both member states and the EU sit in fact in the steering board, as I said, and who this management boards of the agency have actually done double hats. They serve both national and European authorities. Thus, potential tension, competition and or conflict between national and European interests seems to be inherent to the composite character of the EU executive. The hybridity, in fact, and complexity is not only increased where account is taken of the fact that not, they not only assist, the agencies do not only assist EU institutions, but may also act for the European for the member states. EASA, for example, the Aviation Safety Agency, acts at times as the authorized representation of EU member states, concluding arrangements at the global level, uh, uh, for example, with very and various uh, third countries. By this, an, another dimension of the phenomenon of double-headedness of agencies is added. Now, let me turn to my last point on accountability. Before talking about the specific uh, 
accountability issues relating to the enforcement of agencies, I would like to connect the last point that I mentioned, namely had a discussion of the um, of agencies as in-betweeners, uh, whereby I just would like to mention that an agency may be borrowed by a member state to implement the law, as we saw in the fact of aviation safety. This is as such permitted by EU law and therefore also not tr troublesome in practice. However, it would raise more general concerns about their accountability in, specific, in this specific uh, setting. To whom actually are EU agencies accountable in these situations where these agencies act on behalf of the member states? The accountability questions of EU agencies is a general problem that is inherent to the hybrid character of EU agencies. As in-betweeners, EU agencies, in contrast to EUS and member state agency, present very specific accountability problems. Whose agenda are they pursuing? When and why? Who are their masters? How easily can they be persuaded by their respective masters? And how easily can they escape all supervision? When we return to the literature on enforcement of European agencies, these questions become indeed very relevant. Where, where uh, the agencies establish uh, methods and uh, priorities, the need for political accountability is stressed. And where it, even uh, this uh, need for political accountability, these, uh, these case, this would be more pressing where agencies would give guidelines or instructions to national authorities. So, I, um, there's all kinds of questions. In fact, we can also ask even whether political accountability would be needed for enforcement act, uh, and for activities, or should one more rely on judicial uh, accountability? I would like then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen to end, in fact, uh, but only raising, in fact, questions. I have depicted, I think, this interesting trend of verticalization of enforcement and this increasing task of the EU in enforcement, whereby a particular role of the European agencies uh, is, uh, is highlighted. And um, all these powers that they currently have are very important, and I would like to conclude with saying that this requires more in-depth research about the appropriate accountability mechanisms, about the structures and the organization of collaboration, the powers and responsible, uh, the responsibilities of agencies, and how they relate, in fact, to national authorities. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Ellen. I think it's an excellent complement in dimension and analysis, and again, focusing on some key points that we're looking forward to picking up and carrying on. So, thank you very much indeed, Ellen. With which, Fed, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be back and see all of my old colleagues here. Thank you very much. I'm also very relieved, Edward, with some of the comments of uh, Alexander Stoop when he said, as an academic, you're at liberty to say, it depends. Because that's what I'm going to say. It depends. <laughs> um, my task given to me by Edward is to ask the simple, but in fact extremely difficult question, is there a model? Is there something we can copy and then apply to the different areas? And the answer, of course, is no, but I will explain why. So when I was preparing for this, I thought perhaps I will get some inspiration by looking at what we did 20 years ago because in September 2001, there was a similar conference on the administrative sphere in the uh, European Union. And uh, on that occasion, there was a publication, um, 53 pages long. I have not counted the words, but it's pretty long. And I searched for the word multi-level governance. And indeed, there was one mention. So even 20 years ago, this, uh, this issue was of concern. In fact, it was mentioned by Henny Christofferson, who was the chairman of the board at the time. And um, uh, in his speech, he concluded his speech by looking at the future 
And one of the things he highlighted for the future was that he said, there is a recognition that such a complex system as the European Union necessarily requires rather messier kinds of participation, flexibility, and multi-level management, both for effectiveness and legitimacy. I very much agree with all of those words, especially with the word messier. So in explaining why I think there is not a, a single model, I want to start by asking the, I think the prior question, which is also fundamental, is why are we concerned about multi-level governance? Why? I think there the answer is that because the either extreme is not really optimal. Complete centralization, where Brussels, however you define Brussels, decides on everything, will be a mess. It will create huge bottlenecks. Even if you hire 10,000 more civil servants, it still will create bottlenecks because eventually, even if whatever case is processed, somebody has to decide. And as the uh, uh, cases multiply, which are handled by Brussels, then that will create delays, that will create uh, bottlenecks. And it's uh, easy to bring blame Brussels, but there is a very good reason why we could blame them sometimes, because they are far removed from the local problems and from the specific issues of implementation. So the idea of getting the European Commission to decide on everything, it's a pretty bad idea. How about the other extreme? Decentralize everything. That, why not? Well, that creates other problems of its own, because then you have non-uniform application of the different rules. There is different understanding of the rules. There is difference in the rigor of enforcement. And bear in mind that uh, when national authorities implement anything or enforce anything, they do it within the context of their own legal system. That in itself creates differences. So, the, the reason why there is no single model is because when tackling different problems, the essence of the problem varies from policy area to policy area. In some policy areas, we want uniform enforcement. Therefore, you need some kind of centralization. In some other areas, um, you need to be close to the local problem. Think of structural funds it would have been a kind of a nightmare of uh, 1984 when uh, uh, the, the officials in Brussels would tell you what kind of uh, program you need to fund in Poland or in Hungary or in Greece or in Italy in a small village somewhere up in the mountain. Um, how on earth would they have any uh, understanding, proper understanding of the problem of that uh, locality? So. Um, the, the need varies. As I said, if uh, uniform enforcement is the objective, then you need some kind of centralization. If closeness to the local problem is the objective, then you need decentralization. Which leads me to my four statements. So I will conclude fairly quickly. <laughs> First, in fact, you can break down the problem in different components. So in most cases, you always have a, an approach which is based on a mix. Example, even when the treaty itself confers to the European Commission competences, as in the case of state aid, where the Commission can control everything and no one else has competence to determine whether state aid or a subsidy is compatible with the internal market, the Commission has found out, and member states have found out, that when they notify every little measure to the Commission, they end up having to wait for a very long time. And if you want to control everything, you end up controlling nothing. So until a few years ago, the Commission had adopted a very formalistic approach without, in fact, 
checking the essence of, of the problem and without checking whether indeed that subsidy created positive effects or negative effects. What was the solution? Partial decentralization. So the commission adopted regulation, was empowered by the council to adopt the regulation to enable member states to implement certain kinds of subsidies that were not likely to distort the market extensively without having first to ask the permission of the commission. So we see that even in an area where the treaty says it should be centralized, in fact, the practical solution is a mixture of centralization and decentralization. Take another example, um, the single supervisory mechanism. The ECB was granted exclusive competence to supervise banks in the Eurozone. There are two and a half thousand banks in the Eurozone. Even if, you, if the ECB would hire another 2,000 officials, they wouldn't have been able to supervise competently, and I emphasize the word competently, two and a half thousand banks. So the solution is you get the ECB to supervise the big banks that may have uh, operations in more than one member state, and you let the, uh, the uh, national supervisor authorities deal with the smaller banks that affect only those countries. But having said that, I'm sure you know, you have realized from the two speakers that came before me that that immediately creates a problem. So if the ECB has the competence given to it by law, but in practice it has to share the task with national authorities, then somehow they need to cooperate. And I thank both of you because first, uh, Professor Holman said, we are in a network and now we have to solve the problem of how to cooperate between uh, uh, different authorities. And I will conclude also by mentioning the issue of accountability um, uh, created by the fact that we need to cooperate within these networks. So first conclusion, the best approach is a mix. Second conclusion is that I, again, when I was preparing for this, I looked at different policy areas. And what struck me is that regardless of whether there is more or less centralization, all these different models share at least three characteristics, and they're everywhere. First, they share information. Second, there is guidance from the agency or the commission. And third, they establish problem-solving procedures. So all these um, uh, different policy areas, you find these common characteristics. Third, they evolve over time. What the optimum model is today may not be the optimum model tomorrow. And uh, uh, in fact, Alexander Stoop also uh, highlighted this issue of continuous process over time. And fourth, indeed I agree with you, um, Ellen, that we do have a serious problem of accountability. And I want to uh, mention an example, a recent example. The uh, ECB um, decides on uh, the supervision of a bank, how it, it, what the bank needs to do. It receives information from the national authority in order to do that. The information is wrong. The bank goes to the, to the court and wins. And the court said, I have jurisdiction over the decisions of the national authority, not the national court. I am the bank. How on earth do I know which court to go to if I only get a decision and the decision doesn't say this part is decided by me, this part is decided by somebody else. So that is a big problem now, I think. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, may I first of all congratulate the sixth Director General of the Institute for, and his colleagues in the faculty for this uh, excellent 40th anniversary event. May I offer a couple of comments based on my experience from the 80s and today? The panel has really highlighted the key issues. Congratulations. There is a process problem in the European Union between the various levels. There is an accountability problem. There is an additional problem which has not been mentioned. A lack of attention in Brussels to implementation. Brussels has moved too much to what you can call declaratory politics making grand statements, offering large budgets, and then the attention shifts to the next issue without focusing on the how. Actually, APA was born in 1981 because governments at the time were thinking about how a single market could be implemented and how European and national administration would have to work together to make it a success, and they did. So that attention has shifted under various, for various reasons, crisis and so on. And that is the problem today, because you can discuss implementation of policies as much as you want. If policy design is efficient, how can you have efficient implementation? How can you drive a badly designed car? Not even the best driver can. So one needs to give attention to the two sides of the problem, the design of European policy and, the, and as well as the implementation. And you see that today in every area, and rightly some of the panel members point, you, the panel pointed out the silo thinking. Take just a simple, in itself uncontroversial issue, like the Commission proposed forest strategy. It is a one-dimensional proposal which would harm the economic interests of a lot of member states precisely because it ignores the diversity in the European Union, because it doesn't know how to combine centralization, necessary from a climatic point of view, and diversity and decentralization necessary from a multifunctional economic management point of view. And I see there, uh, my dear successor and colleagues of the faculty, really a role for APA for the future in how can we design and implement in a collaborative way, not in a traditional hierarchical way, but in a collaborative way between national, regional, and European government structures, the policies which we need, and how then can we implement them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting point for us to bear in mind, and I think we'll certainly be reflecting on how to operationalize that, that suggestion. Other questions and comments, please, on any particular aspect Do I see your microphone? <laughs> Read your mind. <laughs> or not intelligence in this case. <laughs> well, in that case, while we're, everybody's working, any quick crossfire between the panellists before, and maybe that'll inspire some reflections from the others. If I may. Um, yes, I think uh, all these points are, uh, are clearly directing at this the, the question of design, which was just mentioned, is exactly what, what Fedon was, was discussing with the example, the last example he was giving with the composite procedures in banking supervision um, and with the Berlusconi Fininvest case um, as, as an example. And what, what Ellen was, was talking about, talking about various enforcement powers by agencies 
sometimes direct, sometimes indirect, sometimes joint. And um, there, really, the issue is, if I'm looking from the outside, either as a member state or as an individual, I'm always looking for who actually took which decision. And the fact that because of joint information networks um, and the fact that feeding information into a network and then taking information out as a component of a final decision um, blurs this responsibility is, is a key element. So I think one of our uh, important aspects is, of course, we have to look at, at supervision, but the banking case is exactly one of those where you see information being collected by one body, you know, processed and then uh, decided by another. And here we are really in the, in the procedural question. The, the Court of Justice in the, in the Berlusconi Fininvest case, which Fedan was mentioning, is trying to work its way through with saying, well, who has discretion? And in ever, in, who has discretion is the final decision maker. But that's a very poor um, approach because, of course, there can be all kinds of discretion. There can be selection of which case to take up, and there can be uh, investigative discretion. And there can be all kinds of things which still don't give us a clear answer. So. Um, I think the allocation of responsibilities in the networks and a clear type of procedural rules um, would be a step ahead, um, uh, which, which is exactly what we can, you know, when we compare policies, we have these same kind of types of issues. Thank you, Herbert. Would it answer that? Well, I, I just want to emphasize, in fact, the former role of agencies actually as information providers for decision making whilst what you see now happening, in fact, for enforcement. So that is, in fact, about the creation of knowledge, information, it's more, and which is being taken up by others and how to collaborate with the, uh, with the national authorities. And we see that in other areas where Frontex, for example, you operate uh, side by side with the Greek authorities to, uh, in the return policy of Ill irregular migrants, it is sometimes really not clear who is responsible. So formally, the, the national uh, authorities are responsible in Greece. However, there are, in fact, also uh, stories go, and that's why we need more research, but there are incidences where the national authorities would completely rely on Frontex. So that is, uh, I would say, the importance of, uh, that, that emphasizes the importance of doing more research and clarifying the responsibilities. Because without that, in fact, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not done, especially in the enforcement. If we look at decision making, at the moment, the role of the EU agency is quite clear, and that's also confirmed by the European Court of Justice, uh, wherever agencies ad uh, deliver an advisory opinion, whenever the Commission takes that up or over, in fact, also, uh, the Commission needs to uh, at least be informed by the advisory opinion, then it's ultimately the responsibility of the European Commission. So. Uh, but even there, one would, could ask, well, is that so? Because the Commission does not have the knowledge, actually, to judge, really, what the, for example, European Food Safety Authority says in the scientific opinion. So the, you see that in these practices, the European Commission relies 99%, uh, 9.9% .9 of the uh, cases on the opinion of EFSA. So even there, in fact, one could challenge maybe, is that the case? Should the European Commission be responsible for the opinion of uh, European agencies? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Ellen. We have to wrap up in a minute or so, but we do have a question from the floor, and I hope I'm not abusing the technical management by inviting you to say it, sir. Could you perhaps introduce yourself as well? Thank you, Chair. I'm Oscar Thorsland. I'm a member of the board uh, from Sweden. Uh, I will just short. Uh, thank you for this very relevant and uh, interesting discussion. It's very clear that APA really has an important position in the European collaboration. Um, so I also would like to express my congratulations to the anniversary. Uh, when I'm listening to Alexander Stubb and listening to this discussion, I I was starting my career in the government offices in the in the uh, 21 like that. So and and been working there since in different positions. And my intention, my memory is there has always been a very strong focus on the concept of subsidiarity. And I actually don't hear that concept so much here. I hear discussions that would re re connect to that um, concept. But so I just wonder what is the status of the idea of subsidiarity today. Thank you. 
good, very good point. Can I just, uh, Anthony Zakosevsky, could you just very briefly, because I'm afraid the time is... Just re- really briefly something that occurred to me that maybe we can think about in future sessions. How do you, is the question of how the institutions that are very used to uh, structural accountability and formal and legal accountability are handling the increasing profile, Frontex was a, was a great example, of accountability in the public sphere and accountability in the kind of the, the, the political and media realms. I feel like that's one of the shifts that we've seen in the last 40 years that I can only see increasing. Uh, and certainly I'll be talking about that in my session to do a bit of advertising for, <laughs> for later on this afternoon. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for that. Now, I'm afraid I can't see if I have any leeway or not for a minute more, but perhaps we could have a rounding off, just a quick fire from the three panellists. Fred, you haven't come in yet on the last round, and then we'll have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. Yeah, the question on the design and the question on um, subsidiarity are pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the, the look, observing how Brussels operates from the outside, in fact, what surprises me is that there is much more collaboration between uh, the Commission and, and member states at many different levels. What surprises me is the harmony uh, at the lower administrative level. Perhaps there are disagreements at higher up, but at the lower level, uh, I, I work very closely with a number of public authorities in different member states, and they tell me they rely extensively on the Commission for guidance, and the Commission itself says it relies extensively on the member states to be informed uh, on the nature of the problems. So uh, I think the picture I get is rosier perhaps than many others would, uh, would find. Thank you. Well, on that note of a rosy eye, <laughs> positive view. Henrik and Ellen, any last word? Because I think we have to, otherwise I'll get into trouble with artificial intelligence. <laughs> Just briefly to the subsidiarity point, I think it's extremely important because our structure we're seeing is actually the child of subsidiarity. The decentralized administration, which needed some kind of cooperation, therefore the agencies, as in between as, as as Ellen mentions, have been created, and um, that's that's where we are. But of course, fascinatingly, when you look at subsidiarity, subsidiarity was designed as this wonderful principle around the Treaty of Maastricht uh, to save um, the union from too much legislative overreach, and that hasn't happened. We haven't seen subsidiarity being used to stop legislation on the European level. But where subsidiarity has had a huge de facto impact has been to not have the European Union develop massive administrative capacities of its own, but leave that to the member states. So the very discussion of the network here is actually sorting out the issues of subsidiarity uh, in a way unintended to a certain degree, but but real. And, um, And as Fedon was explaining, of course, necessary because we need this permanent there and back between the local and the, the centralized levels. Thank you very much. And the last word, Ellen. Yeah. Well, uh, that, uh, just connecting, in fact, to the point of subsidiarity. And I think uh, what, what one sees is that also agencies maybe embrace the idea of subsidiarities. Agencies are uh, guided by member states' representatives. Also, uh, commission representatives are there as well. And uh, also member states, or literature says also that member states in some cases also prefer to delegate powers to agencies because they have a certain control in these agencies rather than delegating these powers to the European Commission. For ta- we can talk about this uh, still for uh, at length, but I will have to stop. Thanks. Well, with that note, it's time to round off this panel. And I would like to thank the, thank the participants in the panel very much. So we stop now and have a pause. 12 o'clock it is foreseen. I can't see, is Fiona in sight to know whether we can make it 15 minutes still?